Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and today we have another Humankind patch rundown, as the Endgame Conditions patch just went live yesterday. And looking at the patch notes here, we see that the main additions to the game is the Endgame Conditions, which is a list of options that you can turn on or off for different things that would trigger the Endgame. This is all tech research, this is 21 stars, this is going to the Mars. You can turn these off so you can play a bit longer. Of course, the victory condition is still having the most fame. In addition to this change, there is the addition of expensive district balancing. This is the change to the district cost formula. It used to be a set cost for each district type. Let's say a regular district will cost 80, and it will add 20 times how many districts you have to the 1.16 power, for example and that's how district cost scaled. The game felt that, or the developers felt that, that scaling wasn't enough, that you could still snowball out of control. So onto that formula, they added a second exponential, which is D to the 2.25 power, or D to the 2.5 power for harbors, and I think just to the second power for emblematic districts. There's a slightly different formula for each type of district, and you can see a sort of description here it's not super important, but essentially districts are going to cost more and more if you have built more copies of that type of district in your city. And I personally really hate this change because it forces players to play with as many cities as possible. Pretty much all the changes they have pushed so far encourages to have a lot of small cities rather than a few large cities or even one city challenge those things just become incredibly difficult, especially since this is a fame game and they made Expansionist Star such an easy take with the nerf to how many is required, no matter how big the map is. We played recently a huge map with the Fabius Maximus patch, and it just seems like you should be getting three Expansionist Stars in every era, or you're simply missing out. And it's allowing the AI, who typically expand a lot, pick up a lot of really easy fame scores. So this is another way that's kind of punishing bigger cities because you're going to have more district in bigger cities. Then we have the meat of this patch, this huge list of military balance changes, which looks like a mess because there are things like combat strength changes mixed in with upkeep changes, mixed in with cost requirement changes. They're not even sorted by era. They try to keep most of them together, but they're still random ones all over the place. But luckily for you, I made some infographics for these. So we'll be looking at those instead and be slightly more clear because some of the terminologies they used are more of a back-end coding terminology. Like for example, they have chariot archers, noble archers, and war chariots for the Egyptian Markabata, uh, the Gigar, and the Janchu. And I can understand why they did that because they don't want to mix code with these foreign languages essentially, uh, but it's kind of hard to match things if you just look at these changes here. And because the organization and just the sheer number of changes, you're not really going to get a full sense of what's actually getting changed. So let's go check out the infographic I made. And if you enjoy these infographic, they're also available on my Instagram, which I have linked in the pinned comment below, where I keep pretty much all the humankind guides and you can check them out there. So let's hop over to the infographic and see all the changes to these military units in the game. Alrighty, so first things first, it's color coded. So if you see a dark green background, it means it's a huge buff in my opinion. If it's orange, it's neutral. If it's red, it's a nerf. And the first thing we gotta take care of is the upkeep change. So in the game, for each era, there is three tiers of upkeep pricing system that the game use. So for example, in the first ancient era, there's three tiers of pricing. It used to be one, two, three, or actually it used to be zero, one, and three. And then in the last patch, they changed it to one, one, and three because they didn't want to have any free units. And now it's changed to one, one, and two. And overall, as you can notice here, pretty much every single upkeep cost in the game have been reduced. So they're really encouraging building units, they're really encouraging going to war, getting those militaristic star, which I also don't entirely agree with in terms of the direction of the game. I don't like 
forcing players to play a certain way. Because the game entirely focuses on fame, and the stars are weighted equally pretty much, unless you count the faction affinity as a slight difference, basically you are forced to fight sometime in your game. Playing a peaceful game handicaps you by a lot because you give up three stars in each era and that's 18 stars worth of fame, especially now that they're encouraging you to produce more units, especially during the fourth and fifth era with the huge discount to the original upkeep. It's going to be a problem, but overall it's a nice change. It frees up your gold income for those few armies that you will have and you can use those gold income on other things like buildings and so forth. And keeping this in mind, we move on to the ancient era. So taking a look, the changes are to warriors with a reduction of cost to 45. And in a theme that's gonna be consistent throughout the rest of this update with some minor issues in the contemporary era is the matching of unique faction units to the cost of the base game unit that they represent. For example, for the Mycenaeans, the Promachi used to cost 180. Double of the warrior, they're seen as a warrior replacement. So now with the warrior going to 45, the Promachi is also gonna to go to 45. And the upkeep will also match the cost of the warrior, which currently stands at one after the last patch. So this is a huge buff for the Messinians, which is already incredibly strong with their Cyclopean Fortress, and they pretty much become the most powerful early game faction in the game. If you rush them, you built your fortress out, which is a industry producer and also a garrison, you pump out these incredibly cheap unit, you can produce four of them for what it used to cost you one, and you only end up paying one more upkeep than before, and you can rush down pretty much every faction in the game. And it's kind of insane because warrior combat strength is 19, Promachio combat strength is 21, plus their champion ability, which gives them plus four attack in the first round whenever they're attacking. So essentially, you're gonna get hit by 25 combat strength unit from the get-go because this requires the same tech as the warrior and they're just going to kill you. And it's actually kind of scary to think about. And I don't really like this approach to consistency, especially with unique units that are just much more premium than the version that's generic for everyone else. Then speaking of these premium units, that's getting consistent changes to their base unit. We have the Sabusa Kwasti. This is a Spearman replacement. Spearmen in the game right now cost 90 with upkeep of 1. Therefore, this unit will get upkeep of 1 and cost of 90 as well. So it's just matching there. Also a very nice buff for the unit. Scout Riders and Cavalry Unit and Armored Units in general are going to get their cost increase in this patch. They're trying to make you feel like that the infantry variant are going to be the cheapest variant in the era and the cavalry variant or the armor vehicle variants are going to be the more expensive tier in the era. And that kind of makes sense, but they didn't buff the combat strength of many of the cavalry unit, and I really don't think that's a good approach. But anyways, scout riders are going to double in cost. Then javelin throwers are getting a combat strength increase. So they're jumping from 19 combat strength to 21 combat strength, and the Ambusher trait is a bonus combat strength if you are standing in forest. It goes from 4 points to 6 points. And I think that's actually pretty high. It's a very huge buff for a unit that perhaps needed it. It wasn't the strongest unit in the era. And as an archer replacement, I think it specializes in certain terrain, which I think is fair because the Ambusher damage is not always going to be on. You can play around that, in my opinion. Then we see the chariot. The chariots are getting changed across the board. These chariots used to cost two copper and one horse. Now they're gonna cost one copper and two horse. So this two horse nerf is actually okay. I feel like it's equally hard to get two copper 
and two horse. So basically you have to do a good job scouting the map to see what exactly you have before deciding what culture you're going to pick from the Neolithic era into the ancient era. And we can see the three faction unique variants of the chariot are all getting their resources changed to match that of the base chariot. So if you needed two horse and one copper before, now you're going to need, or if you need a one horse and one copper, like say Jan Chua and Gigar, you're now going to require two horses and still the same one copper. For the Markabata, this is a huge, huge nerf because the specialty of this unit was originally it didn't need copper. You only needed one horse to build your chariot. Now you're going to require two horses and one copper. So you're taking the biggest hit here because previously you were the special unit that you could build without incurring a lot of resource cost. So this is the change for consistency. Do I really agree with it? Maybe. I feel like if they're going to make Chariot such a premium resource unit compared to the rest, perhaps they should have more premium combat strength, especially since they require the wheel technology, which is a much later technology compared to the rest, but we're not seeing any real combat strength changes here. Then moving on to the classical era, we see this reduction of resource going farther with iron. So swordsmen and all swordsmen equivalent are going to require zero iron moving forward. So they become a generic unit that you can use regardless of whether you get strategic resource. And I think this is kind of fair because I think a common complaint is you can't plan around iron resources because you can't see them on the map until you reach the classical era. So you can't predict it. And if you end up without iron, then you don't have swordsmen. And that's a huge hit to your military strength in the classical era. So this is a good change in my opinion. So uh, Chatelet and uh, Gasti. Uh, Gasti is actually seeing a pretty big change. It used to be a standalone unit for the Celts. Now it becomes the swordman unit. The Celts used to be able to recruit both the swordmen and the Gastis, and you had a warrior. It can only upgrade into a swordsman, but not your unique unit. Now it's getting changed where the Gastis is just going to be a swordsman. You can no longer produce swordsmen as the Celts, and you can upgrade warriors into your faction unique unit, which is kind of nice. And then we have the Gothic cavalry in the middle here for uh, the Goth. And they are changing the required resources from two iron to one and one horse to two. Very similar change to what we had for the chariot. And anytime you reduce the iron requirement, it's going to help a lot. But in essence, it's still a very difficult prediction to see if you can get two copies of the horse. Perhaps you should play just on abundant strategic resources to make sure you can enjoy all the units. It's a fairly strong cavalry unit. So... That part of, of it, it's pretty good. And the cost wise, it's actually half cost compared to the horsemen, which it replaces. So it only costs 90 to build the Gothic cavalry. As a matter of fact, I think this is an oversight by the people doing the balancing because they want the consistency cost. Hunnic Horde is the other cavalry or horsemen replacement in this era, and they cost 180, which is the same cost for the horsemen. And here we have this you know, unique unit for the goth that is a horseman replacement, but costs only 90. Even the chariots cost 180. So this is extremely cheap unit and very good value because it has higher combat strength than all the standard horsemen and even hunting hordes. And now you can produce it with slightly more horse and slightly less iron. And then we have the ore elephants. So ore elephants uh, basically changes their copper requirement over to an iron requirement. It becomes one copper, one iron instead of two copper. And this is fine. This is actually the good news because you get only one strategic resource of a type. That's usually pretty easy to find. Getting two copies of the same is fairly difficult. But the nerf here from that slight buff is that you lose one combat strength. Now on paper, this doesn't seem like that much, but you have to remember that the War Elephant's special trait, it is a unique unit for the Carthage, they have Trample, which gives them plus four combat strength only if they are stronger than the enemy unit. 
Therefore, losing this one point actually matters quite a bit for this unit, because if you're up against a standard 29 combat strength unit with the AI boost of like even veterancy or difficulty boost, it's going to be a little bit harder for you to be stronger than units of the same era now. And if you're not stronger, you're losing four points of combat strength. So it's not just one point here. It could potentially be a five point nerf uh, from the special effect not being triggered. So I'm going to keep it neutral. The resources part is good. The combat strength part, not so good. Then we have the Praetorian Guards for the Romans. Uh, the problem with the Romans have been the fact that their triumphal arch is just terrible. So it's hard to pick them. And on top of that, their unique unit here used to require Imperial powers to unlock. It's a fairly late tech in the tree compared to the standard Swordman unlock. Now this unit is going to align itself with the Swordman. The cost is going to be the same. You don't need iron anymore, and you don't need to research Imperial power. All you need is standing army, which is what you get for the swordsmen, and you can produce them a lot faster. They are super strong. They have 30 combat strength compared to the 26 on the standard swordsman, and they can provide adjacent unit, same copy unit, with the same ability flanking as long as they're touching. So you don't need to be standing across from each other. You can just be touching and it'll count as a flank and you actually get five points for that instead of the standard four points. So essentially you have two of them. They're 35 combat strength each and that's really, really good. Uh, their cost, I don't think went down. I think their cost is still 180, but I could be wrong there. But I know their technology requirement did go down. And even if their costs you know, stay high, I still think it's a huge buff because you don't need iron for this unit you can get it so much earlier, and it is so much stronger than the swordman that it replaces. Now you just have to worry about what you're going to do with the emblematic building as the Romans. Then for the noble javelineers of the Mayans, you get plus one combat strength, not a huge change. There is a change to their poison effect. It used to be minus two movement and minus one range. Now the poison is buffed to just capping the enemy unit at two point of movement and one range. So instead of reducing it for whatever high amount they have, it just caps them at this low level, which actually makes them stronger against later era units, which is actually kind of strange. So if you keep your javelineers until later and have them poison later era units, you can reduce their movement and range by a lot more than attacking same era units, which is kind of funny, but um, it's an interesting change. I don't give too much weight to it because you're going to upgrade these units. I doubt you'll keep them just for that. Raw combat strength is still a big advantage in the game. And that's going to be every unit that is changed in the classical era. Moving on to the medieval, we have a lot of changes. Starting with the increased cost to crossbow unit and crossbow equivalent unique unit, in this case the longbowman. Their cost goes up to 400, it doubles, it matches the cost of great swordsmen and pikemen from this period. So pretty much all infantry is going to cost 400. The upkeep goes down, but really they're actually increasing the upkeep tier. But because the changes we saw earlier with the cross the line decrease in upkeep, it actually ended up going down. So pretty much all the upkeep are going down and the cost being doubled is a nerf for them. Then for the Great Swordsman, Iron requirement goes down by one, very similar to what happened with the regular Swordsman. Now you had a whole era to plan your expansion to acquire Iron, so having this requirement for the generic unit, I feel like it's quite fair. Then the Varian Guards is actually getting a pretty big nerf, but I think it's a fair nerf, so I'm not gonna give it the dark red. You're losing five combat strength, but honestly, before this nerf, this unit was basically the Great Swordsman replacement, and they had 43, whereas the Great Swordsman have 35. So even after this nerf, you're still three point clear of your generic replacement. The only negative you can quote for this unit is they have honor, so they can't retreat. But in the case where you had eight extra combat strength for a unit of the same tech, same cost, you are never going to retreat. And now having a three point bonus, it might be slightly closer because AI with difficulty bonuses and certain 
maybe tenants will have higher combat strength than you, but overall it was simply too strong. So this nerf is warranted. It is still a nerf though, so we highlighted it in red. And then we have Kumar's Siege Elephants, uh, the Davini uh, Gaja. And elephants in general are getting nerfs like crazy across the board. I don't understand why. They typically are on later tech. And if you think about it, elephant should be strong, but perhaps they just been abused quite a bit from whatever stat they're looking at. But I think in all honesty, what's happening is a lot of people are picking the Kumar because they're strong and then they're using the elephants. So their stats are skewed. So it feels like you need to nerf them. But in reality, I don't think you need a five point combat strength nerf for this unit. So it's going to hurt them quite a bit. And then moving on to the Jaguar Warriors, we're getting a small buff. Now, the Jaguar Warrior is actually pretty interesting. It doesn't require any resources to build, whereas the Great Swordsman used to require two iron resources. So now your advantage is only one iron resource. So for example, if you don't have any iron, you were building your Swordsman, now you're moving on to your Medieval Era, you still see that you have no access to iron. You might go the Aztec because you can still upgrade to the Jaguar Warrior. The problem here is the combat strength is super weak. We mentioned that the Great Swordman is 35. Now, after this buff, we're matching that. So that's good. And on top of that, there is an extra benefit that they cost half price. I think they're the only infantry unit in this era that still costs 200 after the crossbowmen and longbowmen uh, nerfs. So you can still get them very cheaply they don't lose combat strength when damaged. They now match the standard Great Swordsman. So it's a pretty nice group of buffs for them, but overall they're still a low end unit that you kind of just want to get away with because you don't have resources, for example. Then for the Knight replacement, the Francie uh, Millilites and the Teutonic Knights, they're getting their cost doubled to match that of the Knight and upkeep drops a little bit partially because of the ranking changes from uh, the patch that we mentioned. So just think all the upkeep are coming down. Then for the Haras, this is more of a horseman replacement. It used to require three horse resources, which is just insane. I don't know anyone who can get that. I mean, if you're playing on abundant strategic resources, perhaps, but it was very difficult. So now coming down to two, it's much better. Of course, you could trade for it. But then if you're playing so peacefully with so many trade, why would you need the Horus? It has the same combat strength as the Knight, but technically it used to be extremely difficult to get because of the three horse resources. So it costed half price to build. I think it still costs 400. So that's still a pretty big advantage. So overall, I think this unit got a fairly nice buff actually, because you're getting a Knight unit for half cost and the only real requirement here is two horses, which is actually what the knight costs anyways. The knight is two horses plus, I think, two iron on top of that. Maybe one iron. I could be wrong there. I think it's elite. No, I think it's two iron. I think it's two horses, two iron. Now it's two horses for the Haras. Same combat strength as the knight and half cost. So pretty good. Mongol Horde is getting a small buff, which I think they need. As much as people complain about the Hunting Horde and the Mongol Horde, I don't think they're very strong. First time you face them, when the AI used them against you, you get caught off guard, you get scared, and you lose and you complain. Sure, but in all honesty, both units are very low end in terms of combat strength. All you need is some pikemen or spearmen, depending on what era you're in, and they get absolutely wiped. So this four point boost is pretty necessary. Imagine having a Mongol Horde unit shooting at just the standard Great Swordsman, right? 35 combat strength getting hit by a 29 combat strength horseman. That's not really going to hurt. The strength of these Horde unit is you can produce a lot of them pretty easily with influence from your Ordu or Orda uh, outpost locations, except for they nerf the influence costs as much. You have to pay up for each copy of the unit instead of just 70 for all four with population. So now even that's more expensive. So they're making up for that a little bit by giving back some combat strength, which I think is pretty necessary to keep them balanced. So overall, a pretty small buff for the Mongol Horde. And then moving on to the early modern era, our 
gunpowder units will no longer require as much iron. So the earlier variant, the Abaku Boozers, and the later variant, the Musketeers, are both going to drop by one iron requirement. Pretty much across the board, iron is going to drop by one. So you've seen that with the Swordsmen, the Grey Swordsmen, and now with the gunpowder units here. Of course, they're going to still require saltpeter resource. That part has not changed. Then for the Halvadir replacement, the Naginata Samurai, their cost is going way down because the Halvadir actually cost 485. So previously, this unit costed way too much. Now it's dropping to match what their standard replacement is. Now there's a reason why they used to cost way too much because they have really high combat strength. Their combat strength is 46, whereas the Halberdier only has 41. So essentially, this Halberdier replacement matches the combat strength of the Musketeer unit. So they have the same exact combat strength. Of course, you can't retreat. It's the honor bound system. Now the fact that the cost goes down and the upkeep actually goes down too, quite severely because not only did the game adjust them to a lower tier in terms of cost, the patch also changed all the tier costs to lower as well. So it looks like a huge drop in upkeep. It actually makes them a lot stronger. So this is a pretty nice buff for this unit. Then for the Wing Hussars, this is a different scenario. Their cost is going to go up to match the generic unit here, which is the Dragoon, actually, uh, because they have the same combat strength as the Dragoon. I think it's 46. Of course, it has Master Charge, or Charge Master, I believe, is a trait, which means on charge, the enemy can't retaliate, which is super unfair. It's a super strong unit. Iron cost goes down, like all units in the game. Upkeep goes down, like all units in the game. Cost double. That hurts a little bit. But overall, still a very powerful unit. Then for this first Siege weapon in the game, the mortar here, there is a few changes. Um, iron drops, oh, actually iron increases, my bad. So seed weapons and armor vehicles, I think you're going to see these resources go up. Copper goes down, so it's a swap. Upkeep goes down, costs go up, and the upgrade tree changes. Used to be motor to howitzer into siege artillery. Now it's directly from motor to siege artillery. The howitzer will upgrade into a different line of units, which we'll see later. So that's just a small change because the Siege Artillery and the Howitzer are in the same era. So I think they don't want you to upgrade once into one and then in the same era upgrade to a later unit. It's a little bit confusing. They're trying to separate the different Siege weapon lines into different late game units. In this case, the mortar is just going to become the Siege Artillery directly by the next era. Rocket Card is getting a small buff by reducing the amount of saltpeter required. No other real changes there. Manual War is changing all their copper requirements to iron. Still incredibly hard to build, whether it's three copper or three iron. So I don't know if that's really a big change or not. The Gallius, which is sort of the Manual War replacement, it's actually a really funny replacement unit. I don't actually agree with this change. They're trying to be consistent, but they're not considering how good the unit is. For example, the Gallius has a combat strength, I believe 37. And the Man of War, I think, is closer to 50. 47? I think Man of War is 47, Gallius is 39. Yeah, I think that's right. 47 on the Man of War, um, 39 on the Gallius. But the Gallius has a special ability where if they're in coastal water and only coastal water, they get 11 points of extra combat strength. So if they are staying near the coast, you get 50 combat strength. Therefore, you are a pretty nice unit. But if you move out, you are really, really bad at 37 compared to, or 39 compared to a 47 unit. So it doesn't compare, but now they want the cost to equalize. Means you pretty much have to stay in coastal waters or else you're paying a heavy premium for a unit that's going to do a lot worse out in the open seas. Then we see another elephant nerf. This is just happening for all the elephants. Sadly, everyone's getting five points off their combat strength. Kind of sad. And then moving on to the industrial era, we actually have a lot of unit industrial era, um, more than that can fit on this page. So these are just mainly the infantry changes and some cavalry. Dragoons will lose one point, which is not major, but it's actually interesting why they're doing it, because I think they're also adjusting the dragoon replacement units to be slightly different from them because the costs are now all coming 
close to each other. As you see, the Kozak is going to be 46 now from 44. So pretty much their power switched. It used to be the generic was stronger than the unique variant. Now they're switching that. MPs. Why does MP need a buff? A huge buff too. MPs now move to 47 combat strength. And not only that, the unstoppable bonus, which is the bonus that they get if they're fighting a stronger unit, doubled. Went from 4 to 8. So that's actually nuts. I don't understand why. And if you think about it, sure, increasing their base combat strength prevents unstoppable from being triggered that often. But that doesn't mean this is a bad unit. That means this unit is advantage fighting everything below 47 and everything below 55. Because now, if they're fighting a 50 unit, its combat strength becomes 55. That's insane. So I don't know why MP needs this change. They're already very, very strong in the hands of the AI who goes Zulu in this era, because Zulu is a militaristic faction. They typically build a lot of garrison building, which is their unique version that gives extra experience when you create a unit. And they just flood you with MPs and you can't counter them until really late in the game, which is really annoying. Like the most optimum play you could make against an MP is fight them with someone of equal combat strength. And that used to be the Dragoon, right? Dragoon was 46, MP was 46. Assume you have the same veterancy, assume the difficulty bonus and everything. In theory, they would be a counter because you can match them and not incur the unstoppable. Now, even that's not the case. You're just straight up weaker. And if you get boost, if you can't match whatever boost they are at, you're still going to be weaker. And their range of fighting stronger unit just went up by so much. So I clearly just don't understand it. And then probably the biggest buff to a group of units in the game is the line infantry and every version of line infantry in this era because their cost goes down, their upkeep goes way down, and line infantry is the first gunpowder unit that can move and fire. And that's just a very strong unit to begin with. Your late game or your close to late game army pretty much makes up of a lot of line infantry, or at least that's been my experience playing the game. And now they are just way cheaper to build, way cheaper to maintain. I feel like they got the biggest buff. And their variants here, the red coats see the same change. The Alpinis see the same change. The Evidence Bureau agents actually sees a bigger change because they are considered a saboteur unit. They have that stealth ability. Uh, Solidars has the same stealth, but they're a little bit weaker, so their cost wasn't that high. So basically, all these are just different variants of the line infantry. Then for the Korakasers, um, their cost goes down to match the Dragoon. Uh, their cost also goes down to match Dragoon. Nothing too crazy there. I feel like that's all pretty expected. Combat strength wise, they're a lot stronger than the Dragoon. They're 54 versus 45. So you could question things like this, right? Previously, it was a unit that cost it more because it was stronger. Now they're just saying, this is a replacement unit for that. All replacement unit should cost the same, at least up until the industrial era. We'll point out some inconsistencies to their metho uh, methodology in the contemporary. There's actually a lot of things that's kind of wrong in the contemporary. And also the other one that we pointed out earlier was uh, the horseman unit, the Haras, which still costs half. I feel like they need to double that to make it fair. Uh, but regardless, these are the changes for pretty much the infantry units during the industrial era. Then we have three changes to more of the machinery, the halitzer, the siege artillery, and the heavy machine gun. These are all small nerfs, or actually, I don't know if they're small, but they cost a lot more. So maybe this is a huge nerf. As you see, when we move into the more modern units, the game is trying to promote the idea that infantry units cost the least. Anything with machinery should cost more. So because the infantry moved down in price, all these siege weapons or machinery will move up in price. And it's quite a significant boost. They go from 1290 to 5155. It's a two tier move for in terms of price, except for the heavy machine gun, which is a one tier move. But still, overall, making these units pricier 
is not fair because their combat strength didn't go up. So compared to infantry unit, you don't get any bonus combat strength when fighting infantry. So the game mechanic doesn't work like real life. So why make the cost match how you think about it in real life? And the upkeep stays the same for some of these units because they move down in tier or they move up in tier actually trying to nerf it. But because the upper tier had the reduction through the patch, it ended up being the exact same cost as before. But I still wrote it down because they tried to nerf that. And you can see that Halitzers now upgrade into helicopter gunships instead of siege artillery. They just basically broke that line, made the motor go siege artillery, and the Halitzer now goes straight into helicopter gunship. I'm okay with this change, just so that each unit upgrade into one unit in one era instead of two different upgrades in the same era. And overall, this is the changes to sort of the machinery in the industrial era. And then moving into the contemporary era, we have the commandos, which used to be this premium infantry unit with stealth. Because it's infantry, the price has to come down. So now it's 3,700. And because all the other units here are machinery units or you know armored units, their price has to go up. So anti-tank guns, anti-aircraft guns are doubling in price. But this is not fair, as we mentioned, because commandos have way higher combat strength than anti-tank guns and anti-aircraft guns, who are both very weak units unless they're fighting the thing that they're anti-ing their name. So if you're not fighting an armored vehicle with the anti-tank gun, which gives them eight points of extra damage, they're really weak. They're like 54 combat strength, I think. So in essence, they lose to pretty much all the infantry units in the game at this point, not even considering the commando being a more premium infantry unit. Now they're going to cost twice as much. I don't think that's fair. Same for anti-aircraft guns, which is really, really silly because the base aircraft, like the monoplane fighter you see here, will drop in price to be cheaper than the anti-aircraft gun when the anti-air system in the game is ready kind of imbalanced, where you're very passive on the defensive side. Uh, but regardless, that's the change the game is making. And things like Guardian. Now, Guardian jumping to the highest cost, I can sort of understand. They were kind of broken because you could bombard twice with them and they had really high damage overall. So that part I can kind of see. Uh, they're just a very premium late game unit. You don't really want to use them in direct combat where they lose the double bombardment ability. So there's a place and use for them that can kind of justify the cost. They did reduce the uranium cost a little bit to make up for that. So I'm okay with that. Anti-personnel carriers now upgrade um, from all late game cavalry unit. This is like the modern cavalry. They up the cost because it's not really an infantry placement like it used to be. That's fine. Um, they have decent damage. I'm okay with that. The all-terrain PMV, it's the unique variant of that, matching all the cost. And the, we had the helicopter gunship also matching the cost because it's a armored unit. And finally, we have a very strange buff. So the stealthy operative missile, the SOM, is the Turkish unique unit. It's a cruise missile replacement. It now costs, I believe, the same cost as a cruise missile, except it does about 10 more combat strength and it's stealth. So you can fire this off at someone who you're not at war with and they won't know that you fired it. So I'm not sure how I feel about that. It's not as strong as a nuke and it's not as you know damaging as a nuke in terms of hurting the political balance of the game with the disarmament, giving other people a chance to fire. It's just basically a missile that does damage for bombardment, a massive amount of damage. And now it's super cheap compared to what it used to be, and it's still stealthy. So I'm not sure how I feel about that. And on top of that, uh, the issue with this uh, unit in general, I think what they're trying to do is they're over buffing this to make up for Turk's loss of science on their unique public school building. But in that case, I feel like the public school building deserved the nerf. So not sure how I feel about that. But overall, this is their attempt at putting things more consistently in terms of production costs and upkeep. They're trying to divide their units into proper tier with this patch. 
So I don't think it's actually so much of a balance patch for unit. It's more of grouping units into the proper tier. They still missed a few units, in my opinion, especially in this later era. Uh, things are still a little out of whack with a different air unit cost and some of the uh, armor vehicles. If you take a look at the cost, some still remain the same. They didn't change everything, especially with like the Risen, uh, which is a monoplane replacement for Japan. The cost is still very cheap for that unit, even though it shouldn't be. Uh, regardless, that's not important. I think there's still a few things they missed in this consistency change. And I think after this consistency change, they need to look at the performance of units and then do another balance change in terms of combat strength. Because if you're going to make armor vehicles special or double the cost of infantry, maybe give them a special stat that can make them punish infantry a lot more or make infantry do a lot less against armor vehicle. That perhaps is a better move. So if you're going to produce a cheap infantry and you're going to shoot into an armor vehicle, you should do less damage. Right now, armor just basically prevents suppression and that doesn't really feel right. So these are things I think the game have to think about. Overall, it's nice to see that they're making changes, but in my opinion, not all changes are good. So we'll wait and see until what else changes. And hopefully the developers can see this and see the opinions and uh, take note. So until next time, bye.